this event, right? All right. So this lecture is a little, a little hodgepodge as well. So we're going to talk about some basic oncologic principles um, that obviously you're going to apply to uh, any sort of oncology or surgical oncology. And then we're going to talk more specifically, someone had asked earlier, about colonoscopy and screening for colorectal cancer. All right, near and dear to my heart. OK. Oh, we're going to talk about some genetic colorectal syndromes too, which is a lot of fun. All right, so these are the different factors that you need for cancer in general, right? Um, so you need self-sufficiency of growth signals. You need insensitivity or, or non-response to the growth inhibitory signals, right? Um, you need evasion of apoptosis. You need the potential for limitless replication, angiogenesis, invasion, METs, reprogramming of energy metabolism, and evading immune destruction. It sort of takes a lot of stuff to become a malignancy, right? Anyway, um, so we'll talk about some environmental factors, right? So there's physical factors that um, can lead to malignancy, right? Radiation, tobacco, smoke. There's some of these weird chemicals, arsenic, hydrocarbons, asbestos, the polyvinyl car carbon something something that was with that spleen um, malignancy there. There are viral um, uh, etiologies that can uh, cause cancer, right? Your HBV, your EBV, your HPV. We talked a lot about the HPV already. Um, basically, these can inactivate your uh, P53, or they can um, uh, cause other genetic mutations, right? Your immunodeficiency syndromes, HIV, your transplant immunosuppression, your chronic steroids. All right. Which of the following best describes the P53 protein? C. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, da, 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 da. Some of this stuff is a little bit too in the weeds. I mean, they, they're probably not going to ask you about the you know detailed pathophysiology of the RET proto oncogene, um, but in general, that that's sort of the prototypical proto oncogene um, it, because it is a precursor gene. It's one of the first ones that they discovered for signal transduction proteins, um, right? So there's a lot of things that can happen between the RET proto-oncogene um, and the signal transduction and any of those abnormalities within that cell uh, cycle, uh, sorry, cell communication can potentially li uh, lead to uh, amplification and conversion of this to essentially a oncogene. Um, and then there's the tumor suppressor genes, right? So these are the ones that are sort of the breaks, right? P53 is your classic one involved in a lot of malignancies, but the RB1, the BRCA also is a tumor suppressor gene, right? So then you have some of your classic syndromes like your Lee Fermani. So this is a germline mutation, which makes this sort of the one, the two hit hypothesis, and you've already had one hit um, uh, from the hereditary side of it. So it makes the patients that much uh, more likely to develop a malignancy. Um, so this Lee Fermani has several, it's like breast, colon, ovarian, I mean, a lot of malignancies associated with it. Um, okay, some more tumor suppressor genes and their corresponding syndromes. We'll talk more about the APC. You'll, I'm sure you will talk about the BRCA in your breast uh, lectures. Um, okay. So this is this two-hit theory, right? This is sort of the classic Again, studied more class, studied mostly in the RB1 model, right? The retinoblastoma. Um, da, 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 da. So the, there's a germline mutation in one of the alleles, which becomes phenotypically apparent due to somatic mutation in the other or the wild type. Okay. And we'll talk about this one as it relates to colon cancer as well. <clears throat> okay. All right, so briefly, a laundry list of some chemotherapy agents. So there's the cell cycle nonspecific and cell cycle specific. For the cell cycle nonspecific, the alkylating agents in the anti tumor antibiotics, and the cell cycle uh, anti metabolites in the plant alkaloids. Again, some of this is sort of memorized right before the test, you know, unless you happen to see these all the time. But again, these are, these are good test questions because, you know, side effects of chemo, they just love to ask about. Um, 
Okay, so some of your alkylating agents such as cetoxin, cisplatin, right, we saw cisplatin, 5-FU cisplatin in metastatic anal cancer, um, can cause the, fib the pulmonary fibrosis, can cause another malignancy. The hemorrhagic cystitis is sort of the classic one as well. Um, again, use lymphoma, sarcomas, I put anal cancer in there too. It damages the DNA cross-linking. Your platinum compounds, such as your cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaloplatin. Again, think about your concert piano player, your peripheral neuropathy. That's probably the big one. Nephro and ototoxic, right? Um, again, we use that in colon cancer and some other uses there. Your anti-tumor antibiotics, such as doxorubicin and bleomycin. Um, I don't know if they use it that much in breast anymore. I don't know much about breast these days. Um, but your doxorubicin is your cardiomyopathy, right? That's your classic association there. This interferes with the RNA, um, okay? Antimetabolites, your 5-FU and your methotrexate. 5-FU is used a lot in most adenocarcinomas. Um, it is a radiosensitizer for the squamous cell, like we um, uh, see um, in anal cancer as well as radiosensitizer in adenocarcinoma, right, in rectal cancer. Uh, da, 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 da. Plant alkaloids, taxol, right, so this is, this is where your, it interferes with the mitosis um, by impairing the, um, uh, those, the, what are those little spindle guys? The name's escaping me. You guys know what I'm saying. Okay, combination uh, chemotherapy, obviously, you, if you have different mechanisms of action, you're gonna attack uh, cells in different, that are all in different cell, parts of the cell cycle, right? So it can be most effective um, and less likely to have emergence of drug-resistant cell lines. All right, radiation treats uh, malignancy, it says threats, should say, treats malignant tumors by which of the following mechanisms? I guess it, threat, it threatens them too, but. DNA breaks, chromosomal segregation, deletion of the RET oncogene, disruption of microtubules, that's the word I was looking for, thank you, uh, or EGFR receptor. DNA breaks, right, okay. All right, so single or double-stranded breaks, which uh, you lose your uh, dividing capability, right, because of nonsense mutations. So obviously quickly, quicker dividing cells will be affected more by radiation. Um, and that's also why we talked about radiation enteritis. Small balls affected uh, much more readily because of rapidly dividing mucosa. Um, okay. Okay, Whew. all right, done with the principles. Now we get to more fun stuff. All right, so let's talk about colorectal cancer uh, epidemiology, etiology, right? So only 5% of these are from known defined hereditary syndromes. <clears throat> Other than that 5%, there are three known pathways, right? So this is sort of the classic pathway that we've thought about for a long time. This is this chromosomal instability. This is the two-hit theory. This is the, hey, we've now gone from a benign to an adenoma, to, to a tubular villus adenoma, to a cancer, to we've got the APC hit, and then the KRAS, and then DCC, and the P53, blah, 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 right? That's what we do with our colonoscopies to try to prevent that. Now we have another, two other methods here, the microstatolite instability, right? So this is a faulty MMR protein, and I would say, even though you think this is a bunch of just jumbly mess, these proteins are important. You're gonna hear these at tumor boards, I would know these. MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2. These tumors are typically right-sided, younger patients, right? Some are associated with Lynch syndrome, which again is, represents 3% of all colorectal cancer. Um, stage for stage, these actually have a better prognosis, and pathologically you can see the Crohn's-like reaction, if you guys remember that, or the lymphocyte infiltrate, lymphocytic infiltrate on the MSI instable, unstable uh, tumors, okay? Now you have the CPG island methylator phenotype, and this is the hypermethylation in a promoter region, okay? So this is more of an epigenetic, called like a meta mechanism, right? So the DNA itself is unchanged, but the promoter has been activated, okay? So this actually represents a much higher um, percentage than we originally thought, because this um, pathway has only recently been sort of elucidated as, hey, this is, this is the real deal, right? Again, right-sided tumors, more than likely. And these are the serrated polyps, 
right? We've talked about adenomatous polyps for, for 40 years. We've only recently started talking about serrated polyps, and this is the pathway of the serrated polyps, all right? So let's talk about the screening guidelines. Um, okay, so your average risk, these are, these are 2009 gu guidelines here. Average risk individual, which I think is the last time the American College of Gastroenterology has set out official, official, official guidelines. Um, average risk individuals should start at age 50, all right? It's sort of parentheses, age 45 for African Americans. I know this has recently changed according to the American Cancer Society who says that the age should be moved to 45. I personally agree with it. Insurance companies do not necessarily agree with it, um, but it is what it is. So if you have an average risk individual, meaning no symptoms, no family history, no previous history of polyps, you can choose any of these things. But the guidelines, at least American College of Gastroenterology guidelines, do have a hierarchy, and I agree with them. The colonoscopy is the best test, right? It's, their, it's diagnostic and therapeutic, right? Very high sensitivity and specificity, all right? But it does require, and we'll talk about each, actually we'll talk about each one soon. Um, and then your CT colonography, your FlexSig plus FIT, um, your FIT by itself, your FOBT, which is obsolete, and your Cologuard. So we'll talk about each one of these real quick here. Here's your colonoscopy, all right? All right, so an outpatient procedure, usually done with sedation, though not necessarily. In Europe, the, the percentage of patients that get it done with sedation is much lower than the U.S. I've only had like a handful of patients that wanted a unsedated, or a, yeah, unsedated colonoscopy. They did well, but uh, I think you have to be prepared for it uh, emotionally. All right, so um, the colonic lavage, right, that's the worst part. Four liters of go lightly is what I use because I have a lot of patients that can't afford the fancier preps like the Suprep. There's other ones, so split dose is the best, two liters at night, two, two liters in the morning. 